Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is uh, Mayid Dabbar, and I'm an assistant professor of social research and public policy at New York University Abu Dhabi. On behalf of the Social Sciences Division at New York University Abu Dhabi, I would like to take a moment to thank the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute for their generosity in supporting this talk and co-hosting Professor Joseph with us tonight. This is the first of many collaborations that I look forward to, working with Philip, Niels, Nahid, and others to bring exceptional social scientists to the Institute, working on issues of immense interest and critical relevance to our region. It's my special pleasure tonight to be hosting and introducing Professor Saad Joseph, who is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Women and Gender Studies at UC Davis. Where to start with Professor Joseph? She is a prolific writer, a scholar whose work is at the intersection of anthropology, Middle East studies, and feminism. She's edited or co-edited eight books, over 100 articles in journals and books. Her research has mainly been about the interface of gender and family and state in the Middle East, with a focus on Lebanon and also more recently Iraq. Her early work investigated the politicization of religious sects in her native country, Lebanon, leading up to the civil war in 1975, where she looks at questions of ethnicity, state, local community, organization, and development. She's also looking uh, currently um, at a long-term research project which follows a cohort of children in a Lebanese village. Uh, and in that project, she looks at citizenship, family, transnationalism, and looks at how these things have changed as parts of this family has migrated to the US uh, and Canada over the course of study. Professor Joseph also leads a very interesting study which looks at the representations of Arabs, Muslims, Arab Americans in major American print uh, uh, new media. Um, she's also, as some of you may know, the general editor of the Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Cultures. Uh, this is truly an impressive effort um, at collating um, pretty much the existing research in a variety of disciplines on women and Islamic cultures. Um, and she's produced a number of very interesting volumes and supplements. We actually have copies of those available uh, by the door at the reception desk if you're interested. In addition to her um, research, uh, one would characterize Professor Joseph really as a pioneer uh, in the academy. She founded the Middle East Research Group in Anthropology, which later evolved into the Middle East section of the Anthropologi uh, American Anthropological Association. Uh, she also founded the Association for Middle East Women's Studies, AMUS, uh, and the Arab Families Research Group. Uh, she was president of MESA, the Middle East uh, Studies Association of North America, and she also co-founded the Gender Studies Program and the Middle East South Asia Program at UC Davis. So she's somebody who's a real institution builder. Interestingly, Suad has also really reached out to uh, networks of scholars and academics, both junior and senior, uh, in the Middle East region. So she um, founded and directs a five-university consortium, which includes AUB, the American University of Beirut, AUC, the American University of Cairo, uh, the Lebanese American University, and Birzeit, and the University of California, Davis. Um, and has a very interesting research project, which includes a collaboration between scholars uh, at these universities. And if that wasn't enough, she also won numerous awards for her teaching, one of which was the UC Davis Prize for Undergraduate Teaching uh, in 2014, which is apparently the largest such prize in the United States. So I'm really, really delighted that she's with us here today. Um, the students who are taking my class, uh, Women in Work in the Gulf, have already been reading her work and are very excited at hearing her tonight. Um, many aspire to be scholars at her caliber who had left a really big impact on her field, on the institutions that she's worked in, and certainly the communities whose lives she's touched. So tonight, she's gonna to give us a talk titled Family Matters, Theorizing State and Family in the Arab Region. We're gonna have about 45 minutes after for Q&A, so I look forward to taking your questions then. Thank you so much. Thank you, May, for that very generous and lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. My first visit to NYU Abu Dhabi, though not my first visit to Abu Dhabi or uh, UAE. Welcome. 
So what I'm going to be doing today is give an overview of a number of the issues related to the question, the relationship between family and state, which is a topic I have been working on for many years. And let me start by painting a large picture and situating the research or the, the general question of family in the context of the many events that we face uh, in our region of the world. What is going on? in our region of the world, especially the Arab world. We've got the spring, the Arab Spring of 2011, and it's all too frequent disastrous fallouts, the ongoing occupation of Palestine with unending atrocities, the failed wars on Iraq and Afghanistan, the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the stumbling new nations of Sudan, four decades long instability in Lebanon, the reinstallment of military rule in Egypt, bloodbaths in Libya and Syria, relentless suppression of protests in Yemen, uprisings in Bahrain. These are images that are hanging over the Arab world reflecting and refracting life-death choices. The Arab world occupies the front sections of most national newspapers in the United States, and I would wager many European newspapers. In fact, if you looked at the headlines of most articles, you can easily on any day count that the majority of the headlines of articles in the New York Times, the leading American newspaper, are about the Middle East. The Arab world occupies world attention. Per line, per article, more news press ink is, is devoted to the Arab world than any other single region of the world. History is being made on a regional scale and on a global scale as we live it before our eyes. Social scientists are called upon to understand these major history-making events that we are living in. We need to think regionally. We need to think globally. We need to think for and on behalf of and with a constant analytical eye towards history. So one would ask, in the context of these major history-making events that we are living in and through and with, how could we focus our limited time for research, those of us who are scholars, now of all times, how could we focus our attention to the domestic sphere, to the private realm of family affairs, to the matrices of mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, brothers, the network of siblings and uncles, aunts, grandparents, cousins, the socialization and education of children, marriage technologies, and uh, delays of marriage, generational conflicts, family decision-making, patriarchal structures of power, family migrations and movements, sexualities, reproduction, and their familial contexts and discontents, domestic servants and the household labor, or the various social theories about family, children, youth, and the like. How could we focus on that subject when so much around us seems in utter turmoil. So much around us seems of a magnitude almost too big for us to even think and imagine and, and explain. How can we, at such a time, focus on such small stuff as family? And here's one answer. We cannot afford to not focus on family. Family is small stuff, but it's also the stuff of life. It's the stuff of life in this area of the world, and I would wager in much of the world, family is big stuff. There's not an event that we are studying in the Arab world which is not relevant to families and children and youth, and for which more rigorous research on families, children, and youth could not produce even more important and critical insights for these larger transformative events. And yet, despite Four, decade, four decades of feminist research on the Middle East and, and North Africa, and despite intensive work by the Arab Families Working Group, which I founded in 2001, that's now 15 years old, 
Scholars have yet to do much work rigorously problematizing and theorizing families in the Middle East region and specifically in the Arab world. <clears throat> For the past two years, I have been working on an edited book which is a state-of-the-art review of all of the scholarly literature on Arab families. And my good introducer is a contributor to that volume, uh, as is her co-writer, Ghalia uh, Gargani. We've assembled more than 25 leading scholars of the Arab world to do a country-by-country -country review of the literature, the scholarship, just the scholarship that exists on the Arab world. <clears throat> I've assembled uh, what I think is probably uh, 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 the, the best scholarship that exists on the Arab world. And we're critically ev evaluating that, that scholarship that we can find in English, in Arabic, and in German and French to the degree that we're able to capture all of those languages, country by country. The book is almost done. We're in the final uh, revi revisions of the final chapters. For two years, we've been doing this. Yet almost every one of my authors, we have 25 authors, have, has emailed me at some point to alert me that they were having trouble finding resources to review on this topic. And what were they going to do? How were they going to write a, a review chapter when they couldn't find scholarship on Arab families for the specific country that they were working on? And I even had to hire researchers to work with me at Davis to support my authors so they could do some of, the, some of their chapters. Even I, as I read these very well-written and thoughtful accounts by these leading scholars, I could only think, how could we, as a body of scholars, as well as a society, have devoted so little time to studying, problematizing, and theorizing what is, uh, what is surely one of the most, if not the most, critical institutions of the Arab region, which is the family. How could we have devoted so little time to really understanding Arab families? My only answer is that family is indeed so important, so very important, so central to everything we do, that we think we already know it. We take it for granted. We assume it's always there. It's a given. And yet, that assumption is not only naive, it's vacuous and probably dangerous. What I propose to present here is a conversation on Arab families, children, and youth in the context of state formation and state transformation. This is not a review of the literature. That's the book. It'll be out probably in about a year, and I would really encourage you to take a look at it. I think it will be a watershed in terms of the reviews uh, of the state of the art. It's, it, this, this paper, rather, is an invitation to a conversation emerging from the other ongoing conversations I've had with researchers as I was doing this book, as well as an ongoing conversation with my own research, which has covered four decades of uh, research on Lebanon and the Arab region, focusing most of that time on families. So why? Why spend a lifetime, a career, studying families? In particular, why I look at families in the, concept, in, in the context of the states in which they, are, uh, they uh, inhabit. Denise Cantiotti's early work highlights for us the importance of the relationship between kinship structures in the state. In her edited book, now over 20 years old, Women, Islam, and the State, she guided the contributors to interrogate state projects. She argued, quote, the unifying argument of this volume, that volume that she was editing, is that an adequate analysis of the position of women in Muslim societies must be grounded in a detailed examination of the political projects of contemporary states in their historical transformation. She offered language for us to talk about those relationships between kinship and the state through such concepts as, quote, the patriarchal bargain, which has been used by many scholars. Based on my own research, on Arab families for, over the, for practically four decades, I suggest that families and states are the two most critical forms of sociality, historically and currently. This is particularly so in the Arab world, which has had the longest, earliest and longest history of state formation in the world. That 5,000-year history of state-level organization 
has conditioned every arena of social action in this region of the world. The history of this region often entails, if you're doing the history of this region, often entails uh, detailing the rise and fall of states and empires. That is what the history of this region is about the varying characters and structures of the states, the depth of state penetration into economies and social formation, the relationship of states between each other, the impact of state formations on other areas of social formation and of knowledge production. It was th this recognition of the centrality of states to an understanding of women, families, and youth that led the editorial board of the Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Cultures, which is an, uh, the encyclopedia that I edit, to decide to dedicate our whole first volume of the encyclopedia to a, to a historical analysis of how different states shaped the, the nature of scholarly production on women and Islamic cultures. We, we dedicate a whole volume of, of the encyclopedia, it's about 600 pages, simply to looking at regime by regime, from the, from the rise of Islam to the present, how those regimes acted toward women and affected scholarship about women uh, globally around the world. And that uh, volume has been translated into Arabic. It's on my webpage for free download. Uh, for free download. We also have some CDs of that. And I also have a, a, a preview of the uh, Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Cultures, the online edition back there for, the, uh, for you to take with you. So families are central to state formation. No, no state, no political entity uh, that, is, uh, that elevates it level to this, uh, itself to a level of state can become a state without considering the structures of family available to it and the structures of family they need for the production of markets, economies, and labor force. Every state plans for family as critical units in the reproduction of the state. And even as we problematize, deconstruct, and interrogate notions of the state and families, we also should be aware that, uh, that they, they are nodes through which multiple forms of social organizations circulate in the, in the Arab region. That is, Arab states and families remain in the Arab region critical sites of social action. As we saw in the Arab Spring, the key focus of local political action from Morocco to Iraq, from Yemen to Bahrain to Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Syria, has been the local state. State was the focus of the Arab Spring. Whether the action is a revolutionary movement, an Islamic action group, a women's NGO, a youth uprising, the state is a, is a critical target of local action. States have not gone away. They won't go away. <clears throat> Families also are a critical site of social action both within states and between states. However, I do want to caution here. We should not assume, because I use the word family in the singular in order to make the points I'm making, that the, that the family means the same thing in all times and all places uh, throughout the Arab region. <clears throat> Nor does the state mean the same thing in all times and all places throughout the Arab region. These are points of departure. The term family is a point of departure for raising certain kinds of questions. The state is a point of departure for raising certain kinds of questions. But it's, it does not have an essential um, uh, character to it. It, in fact, is highly variable, changes over time, changes from lo one locale to another, as does the state. So I, we, I want to caution that we should not see these as essential uh, entities or bounded social units. <clears throat> they are not singular actors. The family does not act. The state in itself uh, is, is made of mu multiple and conflicting components. Yet families and states are so intertwined with each other that it is impossible to study them meaningfully apart from each other. Structural, discursive, idiomatic forms flow from and through families and states in the Arab region, making the boundaries between them and within them at times less meaningful than the interweaving of families and states with each other. So families are not, uh, families and states are not separate social units. They are constantly interwoven with, e with each other. This is particularly so when you think of states operating on an international stage, when you think of the, the movement of peoples between the states, the fact that, st that families are so often transnational. We have some of our relatives in Canada and some of our relatives in England, some of our relatives uh, in North Africa. We, we are transnational. 
uh, <clears throat> so the family is not a bounded unit. We are global in so many ways. So while I will focus this conversation on the dynamics within states, largely, uh, between families and states, I want to suggest that we may remain alert to the regional and global uh, platforms on which states operate and, the, and families operate. So this is kind of an agenda for a conversation. Many of the questions I'm going to raise here are not new. They've been addressed by scholars. But what, what I'm going to argue is that we are, we are woefully lacking in theorization that has made major breakthroughs uh, on family. I think we have not really made major breakthroughs in the study of family for decades. So to begin, an agenda for a conversation. First, looking at families and states historically. Historical relations between family and states in the Arab region are under, understudied and under-theorized, as I mentioned. Uh, comparative historical studies are much needed in the, for this region. We need to look at different state regimes, pathways that they try to shape family structures, authorities, uh, the way in which states try to change men and women's roles, how states began uh, their trajectory of increasing control over women, uh, children and youth, whether they use legislation, political practices, uh, over, t over centuries and millennia. We need to study how states involved themselves in marriage, how, ma how states increasingly became regulata regulators of inheritance and child custody laws and practices. They weren't always the regulators of marriage and inheritance and child custody. That, that is a relatively new historical term. So one takes the long historical view. How is it that this became the business of the state to regulate who can you can marry and who can inherit your citizenship and what, what, uh, uh, who the children belong to? How did, how did that become the purview of states? Uh, <clears throat> we need a historical understanding of how states involved with themselves in, the, in child socialization through education, how states involved with themselves in health practices that immediately affected families, how states involved themselves with urban development, which then affected domestic spatial arrangements, how states regulated economies and, and markets and trade, and the circulation of goods over time, <clears throat> and, and the variability in that from state to state. We need to look his, do historical analysis of how states increasingly came to regulate consumption patterns. Trade is, it has immediate consequences for families in terms of what they can consume and what they cannot consume. Uh, we need to look at, uh, at the, uh, with, exp with the, uh, exponential growth of information technology, how the states are increasingly regulating the flow of information, data collection, uh, and the media. It's, this is not simply an issue of uh, that kind of data connection. It's not simply an issue for, for tax purposes, which is the way statistics began. Statistics began as, state, as a state technology for tax purposes. Uh, but, it, but this kind of data collection, which becomes increasingly possible at a, at a magnitude never before imagined, has a profound impact on issues of freedom of speech, freedom of movement, privacy, uh, and access to and control of the intimate details of one's life. Whoever controls this technology controls those intimate details of our lives. And, and increasingly, that gets to be uh, the state. So we need, the, we need these historical analyses. And without history, we tend to naturalize the present. We tend to project the present back into the past as if it, things always were this way, when in fact so much of the way we live our lives in the current world are historically new, sometimes so historically new they're really only decades old. And yet we lose that sense of history if we don't do the hard work and homework of history. Secondly, we need to look at the question of how the family itself is invented. Some have argued, and I myself have argued in other works, that the idea of the family is in many ways the invention of the state. We need to document and understand how the very concept of Arab family emerged. There are many terms in Arabic that describe the family, al-aili, al-usra, al-ashiri. The Western term family does not translate well those terms in Arabic don't translate well into family. They're very inadequate juxtapositions to each other. The term family, the English term family, is really a straitjacket 
and its straight jackets, our capacity to understand the historical complexity of the local usages of that term in Arabic. That term family seduces us into a number of parallel errors of judgment by encouraging us to uncritically apply a host of constructs associated with the Western term family. This is especially so in the field of psychology. The field of psychology is basically based on Western notions of the family, and yet we take those concepts and apply them to Arab families, and for that matter, Chinese and Japanese and other families, as if the term family is the same across those countries, across those cultures, across, for that matter, the, the centuries in which this terminology has been, has been built. It's challenging and perhaps not a productive step to try to develop a unifying set of concepts to talk about family, much as the social scientist in me would like to do so. I think the world is far too complex for unifying concepts. These family structures are highly diverse, and they will defy any effort at unifying theory. I think we will be much richer in our understanding if we do work locally and historically. And I think we will be much richer in understanding the dynamics of the family if we restrain ourselves from importing concepts that are not relevant to the cultures in which we're trying to understand. In other words, I'm going to suggest that we res resist the temptation of universal theories. We resist that temptation much as they're appealing and much as social scientists uh, like to move toward universal theories. Such uncritical applications are often found in political science, economics, sociology, women's studies, and even in my field of anthropology. One of, the, one of the examples of a unifying theory is the concept of the public and private domain, very much widely used in the study of women, the assumption that women are found more, more frequently in something called the private domain and men more frequently in something called the public domain. Uh, that is a, that, first of all, it's a binary, and it's, and it's a very Western thing to develop binaries as a way of explaining uh, phenomena. But it's also uh, a mischaracterization of the dynamics of gender and family systems. Frankly, I think it's a mischaracterization of those family and gender dynamics, even in the West. Of course, one of our most frequently used and uncritical applications of a term in, uh, that is transported from Western feminist theory, and one I will use myself, so I'm making a caveat in advance, is the term patriarchy. Patriarchy among many Western feminists is used to mean gender hierarchy, regardless of whether it is kin-based or non-kin-based. Gender, uh, and while uh, gender inequality surely does exist in Arab families, I think we need to more critically examine the, that use of the term patriarchy, the, especially the uncritical use of the term to explain so much of what happens in, in uh, Arab families. I've, I've suggested in, uh, in, uh, in other uh, works that the, degree, that the degree to which patriarchy is a useful analytic in the Arab world, we should always be aware it is not simply about gender hierarchy, which is the main way it is used in, among Western feminists. Patriarchy, to the degree that it's useful analytical, is highly densely, uh, it's, is densely kin-based in the Arab world and is both age and gender uh, hierarchical. Additionally, I've suggested that, there, that uh, in a region in which states are very often seen as failures by their own citizens, people must turn to their families for many of the services and securities that are often provided by the state in Western countries. And therefore, the operations of what we call patriarchy take on meanings and sentiments very differently when they set contextualized in, in societies where the state is seen as non-functional or incapable of delivering those services. What these examples suggest is that by uncautiously using the term family or universalizing its meaning, there's a seductive attraction to Western analytics and to using them in the Arab context, a seduction most of us have fallen prey to, myself included. Not only is it a, a troubled project to translate family, but it is also rather challenging to, to, challenging to find appropriate terminology and theories to understand the variety of forms in which extended families operate in the region. 
scholars of the Arab world often struggle to use the word like words like extended family or the larger family or the household to explain the kinds of formations they find. So let me give you an example from my own fieldwork and ask you to think about where would you apply the term family. So this is a village I'm now working in, and it's a, I've been working for 20 years doing a longitudinal study of uh, children in this village, their socialization for citizenship in the aftermath of the Civil War. Basically, I took a small cohort of children uh, starting in 1994, so I've been working with these same children for 20 years and watching them as they grew up and trying to understand how is it that they come to understand what it means to be Lebanese, what is, what is their notion of the nation, some very, very interesting findings, especially in the context uh, of a, a state that had just gone through a civil war, uh, began immediately after the Ta'af Agreement. So there's this village, this prime, and in this village, uh, I was just going to take one building, and, and you tell me where, the, where you would draw the boundaries of the, fi of the family. So in one apartment, in the, in the first floor apartment, that has five floors, and each floor is occupied by, quote, a family. In the first floor apartment, the mother of the male head of household is also the great uh, aunt of the female household head. That is, they're related to each other. In apartment two, the second story, the male head of household is married to his mother's sister's daughter. So his mother who lives downstairs, he is married to his mother's sister's daughter. So the mother's sister is always there in and out of both households. She comes to visit her sister and she comes to visit her daughter upstairs. They're always sharing meals with each other. Another male in the building is married to the sister of the father's uncle's son, his father, Ibn Ammu, father's, sister, father's uncle's son, rather. Apartment two, the male household head's father's uncle's son happens also to be the male household head's mother's great aunt's grandson. Are you still with me? Somebody taking notes, writing down? <laughs> Apartment two, I have to write the names in, by the way, to just know who these people are, otherwise I get completely lost. Apartment two, the male household head's father, uh, father's uncle, rather, the male household head's father's uncle's son lives in the building next door, so the cousins living across uh, buildings, I mean, they're, they're literally, you can throw an apple from one window to the other, with his wife and his family. He co-owns an apartment with his cousin who lives uh, in, the, in the next building, an apple's throw away, and the building that, and the, the building that they own uh, was their joint great grandmother's building, so their property is all intertwined. Now, the sister of that cousin who lives next door, uh, sorry, the wife of the, of, the, uh, of the cousin who lives next door, her sister is married to the brother of the man who lives in the other building. The sister's marrying two different cousins. And I could go on. And by the way, this is a Christian family, not a Muslim family. And I haven't even begun to tell you how they are related at the upper generational levels. Now, where is the family in this picture? Is it just each apartment is a family? Is the whole building a family? Are the two buildings next to each other the family? I didn't even tell you how the other buildings are connected to each other. Basically, they're all related. And they're in and out of each other's house all the time. In fact, people don't bother locking their doors. In the wintertime, where they've got to close the doors because it's a little bit cold, they leave the key in the door so anybody who wants to come in just un turns the key and walks in. This is a village. What are the boundaries then of family here? If one assumes that it is a set of residences occupied by a series of nuclear families, much of the complexity that you would understand, the richness of those relationships, and why they are so involved in each other's lives would be lost if you only looked apartment by apartment. On the other hand, if you didn't look apartment by apartment, you would lose some other complexities, which is the ways in which those couples are trying to become something to each other, and why the wives are, fi are fighting with the mother-in-law and trying to keep the mother-in-law out of their house. So, so there's, there's complexities lost at every level if you try to draw the boundary in one place or another. And what I would argue is that in many ways it's a useless battle to draw boundaries unless you see those boundaries as provisional or only question-driven. Those boundaries are driven by the question that you're asking or the event that you're trying to understand. So defining family as a thing, 
that, that, it, that you can compare place to place, I think itself is a problematic undertaking unless we're willing to work from the ground up to see the complexities of what families are, we're going to lose a lot of the richness, not only the richness, but the power of the families. And what I argue, have argued for, for three decades of working on this subject, the family is powerful. And it's powerful precisely because the intensity of those relationships become the lived lives of the people who are members of the families. I have in the past, and here again might suggest, that it would be a productive analytical question to consider the ways in which states invent families or invent the social arrangements conducive to the governance of, of families. Given that pastoral, agrarian, and urban mix of social economic systems in the Arab region historically, there are many, many different kinds of political and social arrangements over time in this region, probably the most complex area of the world. Uh, given the, the, the different kinds of ecologies that were in constant relationship to each other. So understanding how different states managed, manipulated, and navigated these social arrangements to suit the economies of their regimes would shed considerable light on the shift in paradigms of sociality in the Arab world. The social arrangements in pre-state societies do not easily fit the Western models that that would, uh, of, the, of the family. As states emerge, the processes and mechanisms by which states' social units emerge, stabilize, shift, reorganize, consolidate, transform repeatedly are themselves a central part of how states make themselves. In other words, those social arrangements are not separate from how states make themselves. States are making themselves through those social arrangements on the ground, in which case families and states are historically intertwined. So a question that one can raise is, or a point that one can make from this, is that we desperately need historical research and comparative historical research on Arab families and states to look at the ways in which states have emerged in this region, the kinds of forms that they took, and the ways in which they tried to intervene socially in their societies to, to invent the social forms that they needed for their own governance. And among those social forms are this thing that we call families. Let's look at something more. Um, more particular the, within the family, and that is specifically the father-son relationship. Probably the single relationship that has been most studied uh, in relationship to Arab families is the father-son relationship. The father-son relationship is very relevant to today's Arab world. If you observe the dynamics of the Arab Spring, the fates of political leaders, one could not help but notice the centrality of family dynamics. In Libya, Destroying the regime was not only a matter of bringing down Muhammad al-Qaddafi, the Libyan revolutions had to bring down his seven sons with him because he was not just the regime, it was his sons as well. Three of his sons were killed during the protests, one of whom, Saif al-Islam, the second oldest and, and heir, heir apparent, became a focus of a systematic, systematic a effort to capture, and he was captured. So the fall of the Libyan regime was not sealed until the fate of the sons of the autocrat were sealed, especially the son who was to be the heir. Saddam Hussein's ouster was not complete without the killing of his sons, Uday and Qusay, who was his heir apparent, even though they seemed to have tried to negotiate a surrender. When Zayn al-Abdin ben Ali fled Tunisia, Tunisian television reported that 23 of his family members were arrested, all charged with corruption, and that the extended family network known in Tunisia as the Mafia had been practicing the state as a family operation. Syria changed the constitution when Hafez al-Assad uh, passed away so that his son, Bashar, could take over after the death of his father in 2000. The Syrian regime's staying power has been discussed not just in terms of the military, but also in terms of Bashar's brother, Maher, who has been commander of the Republican Guard, or his sister, Bushra's husband, uh, General Asif Shalqat, who uh, was head of the military intelligence. Just as with Hafez al-Assad, uh, his regime was discussed in terms of his brother, Rifat, as well as uh, Hafez al-Assad himself. Family operations. Hosni al-Mubarak was clearly grooming his son Gamal to inherit his position. When Mubarak stepped down, he may have well saved not only his life, but the life of his sons. 
In Lebanon, similarly, fathers have succeeded sons. We have the Shimuns, the Jmayyids, the Huris, the Hariris, the Jumblas, the Khazans, the Sulaymans, the Sulhs, the Karamis, all past political position of father to son. Sultans, kings, emirs, shuyukh, especially in the, here in this region, rule by, uh, rule by family, rule familiarly by definition, both nuclear and extended families. This is very much a masculine project, intensely a father-son project. It is a patrilineal descent of power. So a research question for us. Patrilineal descent of power is by character a family political process. Social scientists have accepted this as a given in the Arab, uh, in Arab societies. Rather than accept it, accepting it as a given, what is needed is a scrutiny of its dynamics and its consequences. We need to research the wedding of state political authority with patrilineal familial descent much more closely than we do. And by the way, this is not foreign to the United States uh, either. Who was one of the leading candidates for the Republican presidency right now? Anybody? Jeb Bush. Is that name familiar? We've already had two generations of Bushes in the very recent period. This is not exclusively an Arab tradition by any means. It is very much a global process in many ways. But what about the fall of the fathers? Zain uh, al Abdin bin Ali of Tunisia, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, Muhammad al Qaddafi of Libya, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen, and maybe in the future, Bashar al Assad. And their sons are gone from, the, from power and some gone from this earth. All of these dictators styled themselves as heads of the national family. They saw themselves as fathers of the nation. Their li larger than life pictures were painted all over their countries with smaller versions, the obligatory wall hangings in cafes and offices. Like Nasser and many Arab leaders, they considered the, na the nation as a family the citizens, their children. They evoke the love of family to solicit devotion to themselves. It could not be enough for them as leaders to be worshipped as leaders. They had to be worshipped as heads of families. Women and school children were to sing songs of love for them. Men were to recite poetry of their bravery and honor. They pushed the obligations of family loyalty to trigger national loyalty and loyalty to themselves. They pressed the tradition of ta'a, obedience, to the father to demand obedience to themselves as fathers of the nation. I happened to be in Cairo in Oct October and heard a speech by Sisi, General Sisi, who is president. It was all about, uh, it was right after the Sinai incident, it was all about we are family and you are my children and I am here to protect you and protect the family. Very inspiring. You know, who, does, who does not want to have a father to protect them? Muammar al-Qaddafi's delusional statements at the end of the Libyan, uh, statements to the end that the Libyan people were devoted to him might well have been something he truly believed. <coughs> like Ahmed Abdul Jawad, who knows who Ahmed Abdul Jawad is? Thank you. Who knows who Naguib Mahfouz is? Okay. Who knows the trilogy that he won the Nobel Prize for? Okay. Ahmed Abdel Jawed is the lead character in that trilogy that, um, uh, that was written by Naguib Mahfouz and is particularly the first of the, th of the, of the three volumes, Palace Squawk, focuses on Ahmed Abdel Jawed. Ahmed Abdul Jawad was truly the patriarch of our imagination. He wanted to live the life of personal extravagance and he lived it fully and well. Yet he demanded, demanded total obedience in his own household and piety. So this man that had affairs with uh, prostitutes and lovers and drank all night long would come home to a religious and obedient wife and, and childhood and he demanded that religious obedience and uh, piety, he demanded ta'a from his wife, his daughters, and his sons. How each of these leaders wished for, to some degree, to have lived the life of the patriarch of Mahfouz's imagination? Research question. 
How have these state familial dynamics been affected by the Arab Spring and its immediate preceding events and the aftermath? Has the rejection of some of these dictators also meant a rejection of patrilineal political descent for authority? Will Arab states produce new genealogies of power? Or will new structural forms emerge, new structural forms of authority emerge? Is the fall of these political patriarchs the fall of the fathers? Are there new patriarchies emerging? Or is the failure of many of these revolutions we call the Arab Spring simply reconstructing patri reconstituting and reinstituting patriarchies? Are the religious patriarchies and the military patriarchies reforming themselves in light of these challenges? Or are they retrenching in familial forms of power? How will this retrenchment or change in political ideologies of power affect family structures and dynamics on the ground? Clearly what is happening in many areas of many uh, countries of this region as states falter, uh, people turn to their families. So family, state, religion, and the law. In so many of the Arab countries, family law is mediated through religious law, uh, substantively changing marriage, divorce, child custody, inheritance, uh, um, based on uh, religion, the practices of religious authorities. This virtual embedding of family and the sacred has made family law among the most difficult areas of law to change. Feminist movements have put considerable energy into mobilizing on behalf of legislation for civil family law and civil alternatives for, for marriage. A significant body of research now exists on family law and religion in the Arab region. It is not an accident that Muslim political activists' movements have targeted family as a primary intervention in state politics. I shouldn't have said Muslim, I meant to say Islamic political activists. Many of these movements are gaining political legitimacy and political power, indeed are being mainstreamed to the degree that even the United States is agreeing to recognize and negotiate with them. And I give an example, when Muslim Brotherhood was in power in Egypt, the United States was willing to negotiate with them. In, in Tunisia, an Islamic party won a significant plurality in, uh, right after the uprising in Nahda. They gained 40% of the, of, of the votes. They nominated a woman for the presidency. And that party, very democratically, turned over power when they lost the elections, interestingly. So we have to look at how, these, how religiously inspired governance uh, has an impact on family law. In Egypt's 2012 elections, the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party also won a majority by a democratic election. The Salafis surprised everyone, including apparently they surprised the Muslim Brotherhood, with a strong second place showing. With electoral rules, a web of old and new rules, and with some seats still appointed, the protest movement was split, and the military vowed to hold on to power, which eventually they did uh, very recently take over power. But the point is that Muslim Brotherhood did come to power, and one of their points of one of their points of departure was to rethink family law. Uh, <clears throat> and now that Sisi has come to power, the military is again not that it ever went away. Uh, it, it military is again in power. But what is interesting is that Sisi is very much styling himself as the head of an Egyptian family. In Syria, the most organized opposition to Bashar al-Assad appears to be the Salafi movement and now the uh, Islamic State. Uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has become a big challenger uh, to Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria and in, uh, in Iraq. And we don't seem to have a very strong secular uh, alternative. What this means is that we need to understand what these religiously organized political uh, movements uh, uh, what their approach is to family and family law as they gain power and legitimate authority. So some of the questions, how will the rise to power, including in some case electoral victories of Arab Islamist parties, shape the role of the state in regulating families, youth, children, and women? Most particularly, how will they shape family law, which is a critical area for, for women and children? Um, so that. The, the critical component for us to look at is that the ways in which Arab states in general, across the board, and all, all of the Arab states, family law has been enmeshed with religious law. 
That is, Arab states have legally located the family in the area of the divine, the sacred. By meshing family law with religious law, it makes family law in the realm of the divine or the sacred very difficult to, to, to change. We, uh, <clears throat> we, we know that uh, actually there very little research has been done about family as sacred, but we, uh, or the family as an area that is considered to be divine, but I think that would be a very useful trajectory of research. We also need to do, have much more research on the social aspect of Islamic movements. Overwhelmingly, the research that's been done on Islamic movements, whether it's Salafis, the uh, ISIS, or all the variations, has been on their political ambitions. Political ambitions are never devoid of social thought. Political ambitions always have built into them a view of the society that is to be founded should victory uh, uh, emerge. And central to that social vision is a vision of what the family is. We need more research. Uh, we need to have more conversations on what is the vision of the family of these movements. So let's look now at women and the state. For a century in the context of colonialism, neocolonialism, and the UN global conventions regimes, Arab states have tried to mark their modernity or their authenticity through iconic representations of Arab women meaning that they tried to show that they were modern by showing that women were modern. Uh, how has that shifted in the 21st century? Well, we know that tens of thousands, even millions of Arab women were mobilized into action in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, and so forth. And uh, a group of, Arab, of Yemeni women in, to, in 2011 burned their veils in protest over the regime. The Swedish Academy uh, awarded the Nobel Prize to Tawak al Karma of Yemen as a, as a symbol of the, that mobilization of Arab women. Uh, Saudi Arabia has made changes. Regimes that we thought would not make any changes have been making changes. So the question for, today, uh, for researchers today is, and the future, uh, how are the states using women and their families as markers on the international platform? Under, uh, under these global conditions? How do women anticipate, exploit, manipulate these processes and opportunities or get co-opted by them? How do, the action, how do these actions, either women's mobilizing using international conventions and regimes or states trying to represent themselves as being modern by, uh, by uh, the way they, uh, they legislate toward women, how do these actions affect the actual structurings of families and women's relationship to their spouses? Uh, or children's relationship to their, their uh, parents and so forth. What models or templates are being shaped for the girl child who is going to become tomorrow's uh, woman and perhaps head of family? Let's look at the question of citizenship. One of the central domains in which states regulate family is its rules over citizenship. In a number of Arab countries still, women cannot pass citizenship on to their husbands or to their children. A number of Arab states have changed. Tunisia, Libya, Morocco, Algeria, Sudan, Iraq, and Egypt just in the past 10 years have changed their laws, allowing more flexibility in women being able to give citizenship to their husbands and to their children. But many countries, this is not so. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Yemen, Bahrain, UAE, Qatar, Oman, Palestine do not allow women to give citizenship to their children. Just today online, uh, I was, there was an article about women in Lebanon. There's about uh, over 100,000 women in Lebanon who are married to non-Lebanese. They can't pass citizenship onto their children, which is not a small matter because if those children are going to live in Lebanon all their lives, they cannot, be, they cannot even enter certain professions because to be allowed into the medical syndicate, you've got to have Lebanese nationality. So actually their job opportunities, their future careers are determined by uh, the fact that they are not allowed to have citizenship even though their mother is a Lebanese citizen. Um, so while nationality laws have been changing in this past few decades, allowing more Arab women to pass citizenship onto their children, uh, and at times their foreign spouses, still almost half of the Arab countries do not permit this legal standing for a woman. That is, a woman does not have equal legal standing vis-a-vis -vis citizenship laws in their own countries. So a question to be, uh, to be uh, pursued. How, has, how have these laws on citizenship affected family structure, 
fam and, and family relationships, especially in this age of transnationalism, especially in this age where no family is bounded by the state in the same way that it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It's this age of, na of migration, this age of movement, this age where we are all living on a global, uh, global platform. How is it that women do not yet have this right to pass citizenship on to their children and to their spouses, and how does that affect what can be what the possibilities for those women, their spouses, and their children? Let's look at the question of state violence, wars, displacement. States, we know, have a, a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. That doesn't mean, seem to mean much to, these days because violence is so so uh, diversified in its capacities. But states can still force men and youth into militaries, force them to fight or die for their countries. And many of our Arab countries have strong military recruitment. Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Yemen, um, uh, Jordan have very strong militaries. In, uh, in Egypt, the military occupies a huge, contributes to a huge percentage of the, of the labor force. The state in general is the sar largest singular employer in the state of, of uh, Egypt. This, this state monopoly on the legitimate use of force has direct impact on families. It needs to be researched as a family issue. Mandatory conscription, loss of fathers and sons and brothers, displacement of uh, family, imprisonment of families as a result of, of uh, wars and violence has a tremendous impact on, uh, on families. Just look at this area of the world. And uh, in another paper I have, uh, calculated the number of people from country to country that have been lost through various wars. One million people lost in Algeria, for example, uh, during the revolution. We've had well over 200,000 lost in, in Syria in just these past few years. Well over 100,000 were lost, uh, 100 to 200,000 lost in the Lebanese Civil War. Just go on, uh, the millions of people we have lost to violence in this region in the modern period alone. More than any other single historical period of our time, People have died as a result of these military escapades in this region, and the states have the authority to engage in these military escapades. That directly affects the possibility of even having family. Some weak states, militias have had more power than the state military. I'm thinking particularly of Palestine, Lebanon, Sudan, uh, where, the, where the militias are even more uh, stronger uh, than, the, than the state militaries. In Lebanon in 1976, at the, at the uh, eve of the civil war, the, 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 the Lebanese military counted 10,000 only. 10,000. That's less than the police force of major cities. And yet there were more militias and they were better armed than the, the uh, national military was. So, questions. How does the state's monopoly of legitimate force affect Arab families? We need more research on that. We have very little research in this area of the world about the relationship between military and families. How does the absence of the state or the presence of weak states such as Lebanon affect families when militias, when you then have militias filling the power vacuum uh, of, of force? So we need, re in, in Lebanon, for example, during the Civil War, Many families were forced to, to uh, literally give up their sons so that, uh, uh, into these militias. And I have numerous interviews with families who fought with these militias because they did not want their sons to be recruited. So this wasn't all uh, voluntary. So some questions. How does the state's monopoly of the, of the legitimate use of force affect the families? How does the absence of the state state uh, or the weakness of uh, certain states affect families when militias uh, take over that power vacuum as is now happening in Syria and in Iraq. We need much more research on the military as both an arm of the state as well as it's, it's the failure of certain states in terms of what it makes possible or what constraints it puts onto families. Children and youth. States directly affect families through their regulation of children and youth. These regulations are manifested in laws requiring schooling. Uh, they are manifested in labor laws. What's the minimum age of work? Uh, uh, laws regulating health practices, 
and so forth. Laws regulating the age of marriage, how young you, how old you have to be before you can get, mar get married, those are state laws. It's a tremendous impact on the structure of families by these laws that states regulate. As I noted in a paper I gave an, uh, a few years ago at UCLA, uh, the number of those who are 29 and younger in the Arab region constitutes two-thirds of our population. Two-thirds of the Arab world is 29 years old or younger. They are children and youth. We need far more research on children and youth, and we needed it before there was an Arab Spring. The Arab Spring should not have caught so many social scientists off guard. Nobody predicted it. Why? Because they weren't paying attention to children and youth. It was overwhelmingly an action of those 30 and under. And yet, even though two-thirds of the population of the Arab countries is 29 and younger, the age structure of governance is remarkably high. So we need research on this. Now let's look at technology. States regulate technology, all sorts of technology. For example, states build our subway systems, our railroads, our bus systems, our airports. Uh, they can facilitate, uh, and all of these are very important for families. States could facilitate this by building cheaper cars, or they could build, uh, or they could allow for the importing of cheaper, of cheaper cars. They could develop a very cheap, uh, inexpensive uh, uh, taxi system, for example, or bus system, for example, in Cairo. The little mini buses that go back and forth make a big difference to the, the urban poor who live in Cairo be, to be able to get back and forth uh, to work. Uh, there was a, a very elaborate system of service in Lebanon uh, before the war, and the car ownership as a result was not very high. The service system has basically failed as a result of the war, and car ownership has skyrocketed, far outpopulating the roads. The roads cannot sustain the number of cars that, that are now on those roads. But technology is controlled by the state to some degree, not completely by any means, but states can, can regulate the, the, the cables that they put down for the internet. And as we saw in Iran and in other countries, Iran in the 209 uh, elections and its aftermath, they can shut down an internet and people can find other ways around it, but their state regulation of technology is very, very important. I'll give you just one example. Uh, and, and the role that technology plays in family life is very important. I'll just give you one example from my field work. I, I told you about this uh, study I've been doing for 20 years in the same village. Well, it turns out over the, over the past few years, a number of those people have left the village. They've ended up in, in Montreal, they've ended up in New Jersey, and I was faced with either having to shut my study down or follow them. And I'm a bit stubborn, so I refused to shut my study down. So I followed them to, to Montreal, and I followed them to New Jersey. And what I discovered is that in many ways, they were as closely, in some ways, they were as closely connected to their families in Montreal and New Jersey as they were when they were living just you know, to, to a, a village away from each other in the, in the village. Why? What do you think? Skype, Skype and what's the, Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook. They're, they're, t they're messaging each other back and forth. One of them told me, I know much more about my cousins now than when I live next door because I know what they're having for breakfast. I know when, when their kids go to, have the, to their doctors. I know what dress they wore to the, to the wedding. In fact, I know more than I want to because they're constantly gossiping. This person tells me about that person. That person tells me about this person. What am I to do? I'm 7,000 miles away. But they're closely connected with each other. They have not lost contact with their families. And some of them say they, they know more about their families than they did before. Twitter. They're Twittering all over the place. They, in fact, if anything, what, what they are experiencing is data overload. As an anthropologist, I am on data overload. I cannot absorb all the data that I have. When I was, you know, in, my, in the good old days, when I was doing my research in the, in the 70s, I knew exactly who I was interviewing. I got the precise data. If I spent 10 hours interviewing a family, that was thought to be a humongous amount of data. In fact, I still, all these years later, haven't finished writing up all the data that I gathered in that door-to-door, -door, you know, hour-by-hour -hour interview over coffees and chocolates and, I hate to say it, cigarettes. Now, I can just sit in my living room with my computer on, and I'm getting all this information coming at me by the computer on Facebook, these same people. 
I don't have to go there. It's, I, mean, it's, I, I am not saying we shouldn't do field work by any means, but I'm saying there's data overload. But it's not just data overload for us anthropologists. The families themselves are on data overload about each other. They know so much about each other, not just because, and, and, uh, and not because they're living next door to each other, but because technology has allowed for it. So we've got a whole lot of new research questions. We need to understand the transnational family. The family we assumed a lot of anthropological literature assumed the family could be located in a place, in a time, in a country. That was, that's long gone. I think it was gone actually a century ago. But it's certainly long gone now. Families are not bounded by the villages or the cities or the neighborhoods that they're living in. They all travel. Even the poorest ones manage to travel some, uh, in, in many ways. So we need literature. We need much more research on transnational migration. We have excellent research on transnational families from Central and South America. We have not, nowhere near as enough literature on transnational families from the Arab world, even though we have centuries old migration uh, from this area of the world to Australia, to Africa, to South America, to Europe, to, the, to North America. Centuries uh, of migration. Uh, child socialization. We have a lot of theories about child socialization. Overwhelmingly, those theories are Western-based uh, uh, theories that emerged in the 19th century that were staged theories. Child goes through this level of, of skill learning at, at ages zero to six months, and six months to a year, this other stage level of learning. And one to two, they're doing some other things and so forth. It's staged theory that emerged out of evolutionary theory that has guided much of psychological theory about learning and, and child development. But does that work? Is that really how children develop? And does that, is that how children develop globally, around the world? I would challenge us to question that 19th century theory that still dominates psychological theory today. And let's think more creatively, more innovatively, more locally about how our children develop. And maybe we'll, we'll think our families are less dysfunctional than we think they are when we compare them to a standard that comes from outside. Longitudinal studies. We need longitudinal studies of children and families. We have marvelous longitudinal studies of children and families based in the United States, uh, some in Europe. Uh, we have none in this region. My study will be one of the first. It's a 20-year study uh, of families in this one, uh, one village that, as I said, I followed them to Canada and the United States. But you know, those of you who do family studies, think of any other longitudinal study a study that looks at one family, one set of children, for at least 10, 15, 20 years. We don't have them for this region. We need uh, longitudinal studies. That's the way you understand what family is, by looking at in the long term. We need also comparative studies, studies that look at families in Lebanon, compare them with, with Syria, compare them with Egypt, compare, compare them with, uh, with Tunisia. We have very few comparative studies. Comparative studies are hard work. They take time because you've got to be as much in depth in one place as you are in depth in the other place. You have to understand the language of one place as much as you understand the language of the other, the histories and so forth. But we need those studies. And maybe what we need to do is the collaborative research. By the way, we have relatively little collaborative research in this region in comparison to other regions. We tend to be much more lone rangers, each doing our own projects. And I think the wave of the future is collaborative research, social scientists cooperating with each other, cooperating with humanists and, and scientists to do the research that we need to have. Uh, Family and care, increasingly, and I know this is true in this area, but it's even true in, in Lebanon, countries that I live, come from and live in and, and study, that much increasingly families are relying on imported domestic help to raise their children. This is a global phenomenon, and it's very prevalent in, in this area of the world. In Lebanon, there's a huge debate. Who's raising our children? What are our children becoming? We have domestic servants coming from the Philippines, from Ethiopia, from Sri Lanka. Uh, it's become a, a, a term all by itself. You know, who is your Sri Lankan? You know, uh, so we need to look at what is the impact on families of the importation of domestic labor, whether it's in terms of raising the children or simply doing the housework for us. It has had a tremendous impact on our, our families. So, um, these are among some of the questions that I would invite you into a conversation. And let me wrap this up by uh, saying, well, why, why study Arab families uh, and why study the relationship between families and states now? 
I want to suggest to you that families and states are the two most critical social institutions in our region. They are powerful, they are enduring, and they are of, of profound forms of sociality. No other form, no other social form has been able to claim the loyalties of as many people as these two forms of, of state and family. No other forms of sociality has been able to mobilize the actions of as many people. No other forms of sociality has been able to shape the minds and ideas and practices of as many people as families and states. And families and states mutually construct each other. Families and states are conjoined and constitutive and competitive forms of social organization. Family remains the most powerful social idiom we have, bar none. If you want to say someone is most intimate to you, what do you call that person? What? If somebody's really, really, if a, really close to you, what do you call that person? A brother. Why not comrade? Right? It's a brother, or a sister, or a khalti, or ammi, right? Or teta, or sitto. Why are we always using family terms to say that someone is close? Why is that the most powerful thing we can say? Why is it the most important gift that you can give to, the, to somebody to say, you are my brother, or you are my sister? Can you say anything more loving to somebody than to say that they are your brother or your sister? Why is that the most powerful idiom? What I suggest is because family is so powerful. Family is still so central to our lives. It's so central that we ignore it. It's so central we take it for granted. It's so central that we have not theorized it and problematized it. And I would argue that, that we need to look at family and state in relationship to each other to understand the stability and instability of this region, this region of the world. We need to understand families uh, as the, as the, the, the uh, civic uh, alternative in many ways to the state, and yet t at the same time conjoined with the state. Family is everywhere. Family is the elephant in the room. Family is the untheorized unit of social, social well-being that we need to understand. We cannot ignore. It is the moment, the most, most critical, in this most critical moment of, of transformation, what is going on inside of the family, what is going on inside of the family in relationship to the state, what is going on inside of the family in relationship to global transformation is a must for us. We must understand our families in order to know what our futures are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I'll come down here. My name is Aida Qasim. I have a question with respect to Where how are you? often Islam, Islam is, is accused as um, the source that subjugates, subjugates Arab women in the Arab world. We know that often it's used as a tool by state. So you talked about family law and how the state subjugates women by utilizing religion. So what are the gains of the state in subjugating women? Can you talk about that? I think you have several questions built yes, into, into one there. So we'll start with the one that you ended up with. Or do you want me to take all the questions at once? I mean, would you be comfortable with that? So next question, we'll come back then. Okay. Yeah, the next, uh, my question is more, uh, more on seduction. Like, yeah, I, I like that idea of that we are all, or many of us, especially sociologists, are seduced by Western or universalist concept. Um, and you, you tend to criticize that, or you tend to problematize that. My question is that at the same time, you are, correctly pointing out the importance of comparative research across space and comparative research over history. And that's the problem, because if we don't have certain universal concept to begin with, do we relativize concepts in historical time? Do we relativize concepts across geographical space, especially when we are talking about transnational families? Hello, my name is Miriam. I'm a student here. 
Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you consider a dysfunctional family? Because you mentioned that um, a lot of families think they're dysfunctional because they base their their mo their families on a model that was created in the 19th century. Um, and how does this affect the output of family members in society? Can I take those three? Because I will not remember. <laughs> Let me start with the first one. And what you're asking about uh, in what way um, is it benefiting the state to control women? Well, women are labor, like men are labor, and states cannot exist without labor. They can, also, they cannot exist without uh, a population that is dutiful in, in ways that they need, dutiful in the sense of producing, uh, being productive in the labor in the marketplace, paying taxes, building the roads, building the pyramids, whatever. Uh, so states, all states, this is not something specific to uh, the Arab world, all states institute regulations. All political entities, whether they're states or not states, can exist as political entities in, only insofar as they're able to mobilize the will of the people that are encompassed within that political entity. That could be a political party. You know, what good is a political party if it can't uh, persuade its, its members to vote altogether? It's not a political party anymore, right? So th this is true of any political entity. The very nature of, of a political organization is the way in which it mobilizes. The question then is, on behalf of what does it mobilize? And what differentiates one, from, one state from another is on behalf of what it mobilizes. <clears throat> and, and implicit in your question was, is, is, is Islam oppressive to uh, any religion? Or any ideology is trying to regulate the behavior of its, of its uh, adherents, whether that, re that ideology is Catholicism or Islam or Judaism or communism or any, you know, capitalism is an ideology. Capitalism has an ideology that's trying to regulate the behavior of its, of its adherents to, to be productive, to be market driven and so forth. So I don't think that Islam is any more, more so that way than any other uh, ideological formation. It is the nature of ideology to try to win its adherence to certain rules and practices. Um, and, and, and Islam is that. Your question about um, the seduction of universalism and yet the need for comparative work, that's precisely the dance we have to do, right, as theorists. And the theorist that is able to do both understand the specificities of a particular um, institution, say the family, as well as, a, as the, the diversity in which it, it, uh, it inhabits, is the one who's going to give us the breakthroughs. The one who is going to give us the, the, the big models that tells us that you know, modernization theory in the 60s and 70s produced wonderful models of how we were transforming and becoming modern. And as we became modern, we, we were going to get more nuclear families, more individualism, et cetera, et cetera. And then we we're going to have more democracies as a result of more individual autonomy. It didn't happen quite that way, did it? So those large models often lose the reality on the ground. And yet, you're right, we need to be able to be comparative, and to be comparative, we have to have some terminology that translates. It's, it's how you do it that it makes for some model or some comparative work being more rich and useful than others. And I, I, think, we've, I think, in fact, uh, even our biggest theorists, uh, you know, you know, such as Marx, there are huge problems with the way Marx's theory predicted the, you know, the transformations of the world. Huge contributions as well. All of the big theorists, with Marx or Weber or Durkheim, or, had, had important insights, but they've all failed to tell us the way the world is moving forward in many ways because the specificities were, were missing. So I, I don't have a, an answer that is satisfying other than to, to that question, other than to say that that's precisely the challenge, is that we have to be able to be able to grasp the, 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 the mess of life. Life is just messy. And to try to give some analytical order to it at the, without at the same time taking away so much of the mess that we, that we lose the, what is actually happening to people on the ground. And the last question, the third question was right there. And sorry, I already forgot. Remind me. It was. Sorry, can you say it? 
dysfunctional. Oh, dysfunctional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, it's a word I really don't like to use because m much of my work has been critical of the way that term has been used about Arab families and much of the literature about Arab families written by those who have been take as their point of view Western psychoanalytical theory. The Arab family is dysfunctional. You'll find very little literature on Arab families that thinks of them in terms of, quote, normal, they're, 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 uh, at least those, by those trained in Western uh, psychological theory. And the reason is, is that in Western psychological theory, the focus is on the development of the individual and individual autonomy and how the individual is, quote, individuated, how, this, how the social, sociological process is designed to produce, quote, uh, the, uh, the autonomy of the individual. That's not necessarily the value, or but that's only a partial value in a lot of families. Does that make Arab families dysfunctional? I don't think so. So what I would suggest is that that very term dysfunctional it needs itself to be problematized and can only be understood in the context of uh, localities. And for us, it's particularly uh, challenging because our localities are in great states of upheaval and change. What is normal about Lebanon now? What's normal about Syria now? What's normal about Libya? How do you understand normality in those contexts? So I, I think that's our challenge. And that's why I would say those terms, don't get, don't, they don't take us very far. I, rather than talking about the normal or the average or the functional, let's talk about the reality. What are they like on the ground? My name is Sana Alden. I'm a professor here at NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU New York. Um, and my question is uh, um, regarding what you talked about in terms of the effect of technology on the family. And it was very interesting what you talked when when you mentioned the example of Facebook and, and Skype. And in a way, it's basically bringing the family closer to each other. And often, as a professor of computer science, you always hear that technology, especially you know, um, in terms of the impact, especially the, the studies that are done um, in the U.S. Um, on, and the impact of technology on, um, you know, the teenage or the family that it's basically had a very negative impact where it's, yeah. you know, it's alienating and creating a vacuum and destroying the social fabric of society. So can you comment on that? Do you think that that's part of what you're saying, that basically we have to come up with different theories that, that pertain to our... Uh, society here in, in the Arab world? What I was calling for is a more problematical, a problematic view of technology. There's been an explosion of media technology in particular that has a direct impact on, on telephone, even the cell phone. Who here does not have a cell phone? Really? And I want to ask you, those of you who have children, how many of your how many of you have, have your children have cell phones? Of the people who have children, raise how many of you have children? Raise your hands. Okay, for those of you whose ch whose children do not have cell cell phones, put your hands down. The majority of you still have your hands up. Those who have children. I was with a family last week, and the four-year-olds is arguing for a cell phone, saying, "Really, four years old?" But it, so, but we haven't yet, I mean, there are some actually wonderful studies that are coming out. In fact, there's a whole journal that is a journal of Middle East and media studies. Uh, so I think we're, we're getting there. We're beginning to understand better. But the, the technology has, a, has had a really, really important impact on families. And we don't know what it is. And I, I think it's too soon to say good or bad. I mean, we know that, that kids go on Facebook and they put things on the Facebook that can be disastrous for them. And we've even had studies about people trying to get jobs and their employers looking on their Facebook pages and realizing that some stupid things they put on their Facebook pages and they don't get the job interview because of stupid things that they've done. We have a, a huge case in the United States of, um, that some of you may be familiar with, a professor by the name of Stephen Saleta, who put some things on his Facebook page. He had already been offered a job at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and, and the job was withdrawn based on, it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't Facebook, it was a Twitter, something he tweeted. He, was, he lost the job, and it's become a big legal, legal case in the United States. So good, bad, it, the point is it's had a huge impact. 
is having an impact on families. And here's a young man with children, with a family and children, jobless because of a tweet that, that he put out in his passionate moment. Uh, I have a student now at UC Davis. Uh, who, uh, how many of you know what BDS is? BDS, boycott, divestment, um, sanctions. The boycott movement has become a global movement. The student union at UC Davis has just passed BDS. One of, one of the students, it's actually my student, <laughs> um, put a, put a posted on her Facebook a picture with a caption underneath that led to thousands, it, became, it went viral. Thousands of people responded to that negatively, and it's been a major, major issue for our students on, on campus. I won't even go into it, but I'm glad to talk with you, those of you who want after, about it. It's huge. Do we even understand the media yet? Do they, do, does a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old understand what they're doing when they're putting stuff up on Facebook? I, I don't think so. I, I think they're often not recognizing that it's not the same as sitting down talking with your best friend about your personal stuff. I mean, the stuff that goes up on Facebook is just stunning to me. I, I grew up in another generation, so I have a, no, a certain notion of privacy and confidentiality and family that is not consistent with the notions of family and private. <laughs> And, and confidentiality and privacy that is marketed in today's world. Somebody, I just was, I just, in fact, here, I was listening to CNN last night uh, in your own, your own broadcast within your, on your own TVs about uh, new kinds of televisions that are being uh, marketed. Samsung is marketing a television that records your conversations so that it can take your, your commands, but it records all of your conversations. And these conversations are being, you know, recorded to a third party someplace who, who goes through them and finds out what, what, what it is that you're trying to ask them to do. Really? In your living room? You want some, all your conversations to be recorded? Who knows where technology is taking us? But it's a, it's a tremendously important impact on families, on individuals, on persons, on selfhood, on our notions of morality and ethics, our notion about what is private and what is public. All of those notions are being transformed as we live them. Uh, and it's hard for us to even imagine what that world is going to be like in another 10, 20, 50 years. So I just I wanted to say a few words um, on a slightly lighter note, uh, Sana. My almost four-year-old the other day showed his new uh, learning of things related to technology um, by grabbing my phone and saying, Mama, let's take a selfie. And I was like, <laughs> oh my god, you, like, you learned the expression. Um, but really, I wanted um, to thank uh, Professor Saad Joseph for a really rich and provocative talk. Um, I really felt this was a bit of an agenda-setting exercise, uh, this notion of putting family on the table of rigorous research. Um, she gave us a very rich talk which described both the family and the state as two of the most important forms of sociality in the Arab region. She described um, through many examples how the two are intertwined, uh, gave us rich portraits from her own research. She also um, cautioned us not to think of them in essentialist terms. And if I were to pull two very important um, points uh, that she drew our attention to in terms of where research on the family in this region uh, might go, the first is the notion of comparative historical studies of both state and families, which look at how states shape and regulate families and vice versa. Um, but the reason is that because we need to make sure that we are not naturalizing the present. We need to really think about how history shapes our ideas about what is normal. But the second is also this notion of resisting universal theory, of resisting the use of concepts that may seem like they should be applied everywhere, but in fact are very culturally specific. These are some of the key issues that I think cuts across a variety of disciplinary areas and subjects, many of which we research and teach here at New York University, uh, Abu Dhabi. And so I'm very pleased that um, uh, Dr. Sarah Joseph has shared with us uh, today her insight based on her research.